Hawaiian dancing. It's a, it's a symbol of good luck, it's a symbol of power and wisdom. And they say that anyone that sees the lion um, is brought that same prosperity and good luck. I've known us doing like Bahok doing lion dancing for as long as I remember. My name is Elizabeth uh, Kiwo Gollan and this is my father, Peter Kiwo. How would I describe my dad? I think a, a combination of things. I don't think I can say one word, but definitely I think that he has this uh, persona about him that a lot of people kind of gravitate towards. Overall, personality-wise, like I think he can be really tough, which is what it was like having a dad who was also a sifu, um, but really friendly. My name's Liam Bunkiwo. I'm here with my father, Graham Kiwe. How would I describe my father? Handsome. <laughs> Obviously. Most definitely that. He's always been a big part of my life in terms of that understanding of, of, of culture, heritage. Uncle Peter is my father's older brother. Yeah. Um, usually calls him what? Daigo. Daigo, he means older brother in Chinese. Um, Daigo, Daigo, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. This is my cousin, a uh, very, very close cousin of mine. So you grew up with her sort of training at Pakok? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty, pretty much we, um, Uncle Peter, the, the, the master Sifu, uh, he used to work, man, like so much, and uh, he used to have a shop, a little sandwich bar in Chinatown. And our studio was just above it. So there was, Dad would, would work there, close up the shop, and then head up to the third level to where he would teach. This is the first, um, first studio that we have in uh, Chinatown. Back in 19, was it back 65, I think? 1965. 1965. Dad was the first one, so the first like senior Australian disciple of Bacho. And a disciple is the one that carries on the style, that is uh, an instructor that is meant to take forward the tradition and everything about the style and carry it forward. You look back like generations before Dad, Bahok didn't have line dancing. But it came into the style when I believe someone from another, a student from another martial arts group that did do line dance decided to buy see kneel down and become a Bahok disciple. And that's when they brought line dancing. This is before Dad's time. Um, back maybe three or four generations prior. So did your father teach you how to line dance? Who taught you? No, I learned from Uncle Graham. Well, I came here in 1963. I didn't start very early at all. In fact, very, very late. My brother was doing it way, way behind me, before me. I remember Dad distinctively teaching me line dancing in his old art studio, which was located in Camperdown, where he would go through moves with me again and again and again, the same moves. So uh, just like how Uncle Peter would, would, would teach us to punch at the wall or find the target and just concentrate and focus, the same understanding, the same energetics of it, but just with a lion. It was just actually trying to get me, almost like bring the spirit of the line and the spirit of my heart, of the ancestors, in form of the one. So you don't think about it, you just, you just move, you know? How did you feel when you started lion dancing? I feel good because first of all, it's the Chinese tradition. It's part of the Chinese culture. Now, I think culture part is very important. So we mainly do uh, southern style lion dancing. So within southern lion dancing, there's two styles yet again. 
right? There's there's the the Fatsan style, which is the the more traditional. So if you look at lion dancers from 30 years ago, they would look more like this particular uh, look and style versus the more modern style, which is Hok San. Um, and they are both very distinctly different. Some people think that the, the Fatsan line is like the master and the Hoksan is the student, which kind of gives you a really good idea of just how the lines look like back in the day, the original look of the lines and how it's evolved. When we learned lines, we had to learn with the Big adult yeah, lions right. and we just had to tough it up and we just had to learn it we had to develop the strength for it but now i think with the the same reason why the lions these days you know have shorter tails are lighter made of different materials um, a different shape because they they support more of a acrobatic theatrical style of lion dancing i think i would say that when people book us for lion dancing the first reason why they book us is for the entertainment yeah right versus the cultural reason whereas a couple of decades before it'd be cultural reason first for what it signifies and then just so happens to be entertaining as well but nowadays it's the entertainment factor and I think lion dancing the design and the style has evolved to support that as well now the lions are a lot more jumpier they do a lot more big jumps True. they the lions are lighter to support that the tails are shorter um, because their tail can easily hold on to the the lion head in front of them even the fur the fur is like a cuteness factor now but the reason for lion dances back in like a generation ago was purely to scare away evil spirits so there was supposed to be this scary like ominous monster that was meant to chase away evil spirits and bring good luck With so the banging of the drums yeah. the gongs the scare things the firecrackers at the same time yeah A lion is meant to be able to convey a whole bunch of emotions that like a, a jungle lion can do. So things like scratch, sniff, act curious, act happy, act excited, sleepy, and even some ways like drunk. But within that, the, each lion head has their own style. Um, and you're allowed that within w whatever part you play, if it's head or if it's tail or if it's drums, it was a gong. So uh, allowing that kind of freedom as well um, is, is uh, a nice way to kind of go. Look, this is this is my character. Yeah, this is right. this is how I'm adding yeah. my version to to this. Everybody can have their own expression yeah. in the line. With the the for me for line, I think I um, I lent a lot more to the to the music and yes. Kevin, uh, my brother, and Liam yeah. uh, are, are the the line guys, and I think that kind of complements the team because we're kind of the generation moving up and there's always going to be someone that has a, a strength in one thing um, and and that's just kind of how how it's just played out um, but knowing that we can all we all grew up together we all learnt the same way means that when we play together like it really it fits I think. I guess we can say this right we sort of we we developed the drum beat I guess in a way mm -hmm. and we didn't have too much mentorship within the music and I guess Elizabeth and I sort of worked it out um, and sort of made something. Well I'd say it's probably you, I mean remember Liam used to play the drums, like the western drums, he played the sax, yeah, like he was got a, a real like musical background prior to um, bring you into the, the club so we we were taught a, a really basic kind of baseline beat but I think Liam kind of brought the, the the variations of that which made it sound a lot more like a lot more fun a lot more engaging but it, that was that was you but I think that was when we actually really started to and I don't mean any disrespect by this but our line that it changed for us mm. The beat with the beat that changed. We'll I guess it was more... our way of making it our own. Yeah, right? I, yeah, I think so. And then also getting sort of our from being a little sh or being a little bloody angry. What do you call it? Uh, just a nuisance. Just a nuisance <laughs> in the club. Sort of found our place. It's been it's been something that's been a big part of my life. Um, it's something that I learned pretty quickly. It wasn't everyone else's experience around Chinese New Year. As a kid, it was the only time we didn't have to go to school. 
If you're too tired, doesn't matter, mate. Don't go to school. As long as you go line dancing, do a good job. When I grew up, my friends, Chinese New Year wasn't, or Lunar New Year wasn't something that non-Chinese people celebrated. For me, like, Lunar New Year was my favourite time of the year, in the way that other people would think Halloween or Christmas is. But it was something that I did with my family, so it was a, a part of my life that I celebrated and enjoyed. But when I went back to school, I would be the same person that they, that they would know, and it's not something that I talked about. Probably looked a little tired from being out the night before, going to the line dances, might have even smelt like smoke from the firecrackers, but no one said anything, um, and I was happy to keep it that way. But memories were just being in, in, in the cars, going to various restaurants, and performing constantly for two, three weeks. That was it. But it was fun. It was great, it was exciting. Um, it was wonderful. People loved it. People loved seeing the lion. They praised us. We felt great. And that was it, you know? It would be just us guys, like, mm. and family. And it was a beautiful thing. How does it make you feel to know that you've passed that on to your children and your grandchildren? I feel very proud. They're interested in what they're doing. You need to keep your culture going. If you don't, we die off. The, the style has changed. The way that we teach uh, lion dancing, the way that we teach martial arts is very different to how it was when we were growing up. There is no way that I could have the, our, my young kids uh, sit through a two hour lesson on martial arts followed by another two hour lesson of lion dancing. Like very different to how we taught. Um, but I think it's just a sign of the times. I think it's just in the way that the, the, the art has, has changed towards more modern, like contemporary styles. And if that's the way that it'll help keep like, the new generation interested, then, then I don't think that that's a bad thing at all. How important was it for your children to learn Pakok? First, give them their, um, give them their healthy, doesn't get much sickness. You see, how's it important. Also teaching how to defend themselves, to protect themselves. That's the only way I teach you that. Not to, I'm not teaching how to fight. Yeah, I think that there was the, there's the physical aspect that Dad's mentioned um, around kind of developing like healthy, strong bodies, um, being able to uh, defend as well. Um, but then there's, I think there's something special in knowing that you're training or you're doing something that has been practiced for generations before us. Um, that kind of continuation of that culture um, and tradition, I think, is is very special. Um, to know that we were part of something that was bigger and that has gone on longer than before our time, before my dad's time, um, is is something that not a lot of people can say. It's it's been established about 600 years ago, so it was during the the Ming Dynasty, and it originated with a a Tibetan Lama that had watched a fight between an ape and a crane. And in an obvious battle where you would expect that the ape would uh, be able to overpower and, and uh, win over the crane, the crane actually won. And the Lama had watched the movements of the crane in terms of how uh, he would uh, evade and how he would attack um, and they said that that's that's actually how the style came into fruition uh, it's the reason why Bahok in English is white crane every Saturday that was that was my that was where I went um, no no questions asked that's it you yeah. could not do anything yeah. Saturdays that was just training parties no there was a condition anything? that no. was yeah if the if I had a friend that had birthday parties on Saturdays, it was an automatic no, because it was, Saturday was training day. And it's so what we did, we, we, <laughs> we, were, we were training at a, a hall in Central, that was the first place where I uh, trained, and we were the youngest guys coming together on Saturday, and then being the youngest kids in this, like, this whole room full of everyone that was older and more experienced than us, I think it was a little bit daunting. Um, and it was a little bit scary. And you know, these guys that I thought were scary, like they're just like these big, fully fledged adults, like punching and kicking. And, and I, was, I, I was scared. Um, 
But then my dad would just come over and just shout at them and like correct them and fix up their form, tell them they're doing everything wrong. It's just really humbling because I'm like, I was scared of him, but they're scared of my dad. You know, in the early years, it, I, I, I didn't love going to training. <laughs> um, it, was, it was just something that I just had to do. Um, the way that maybe kids have to go to swimming lesson where they don't want to go to swimming lesson, but you just have to do it. And it was just, that was our experience with that. But it's only when you get older, when I mean older, I mean probably like from 10 onwards, where it was like, oh, this is kind of neat. This is something different, something no one else does. the philosophy of the Kung Fu, the training, the breathing, the focus, the mental rehearsal, how you can sort of bring that into your daily life and daily activity and everything else, you know, and, and realise it's such an advantage to have knowledge yeah. or to have that focus to be able to stop and just go, sort of thing. Yeah. It's, it's, a yeah, it's pretty thing. special. There's, there's, there's blood family, you know, that we've had my dad, that's the, the grandmaster of the style, my uncle who's there, but then the, you know, dad's main students, Roy, and Gary and Mo, uh, they, they're, they're, they're family, like we often kind of talk about how you've got family that's defined by blood and you have no choice, but then I think with, with Bahok there's, there's a real like chosen family component there and, and it's really hard to, when we, when we say that we're a family, like it, it really feels like that and the way that they look after our kids, the way that we look after their kids um, and the way that we're all there to continue this like martial arts and line dancing tradition together, um, I think is kind of what unites us all. We all grew up together, so yeah, we're a family. We're an extended family and uh, the togetherness um, shows in our performances because um, it's just so cohesive. When we're ever we're talking to other people about the club itself, it's always refers to, oh, he's my Pakot brother, or he's my mm. sister. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing to be brought up in a, a culture, mm. a family, a community, which also does martial arts, line dancing, but helps with anything else in life. But we're humble people. I hope it continues. And it's, I think, I hope that it, it, it has that same community um, that you know, Dad has, has worked so hard to build up um, that hopefully that is something that I, myself and my brother and my cousin Liam are continuing, but then when we get older, that's something that the next generation, um, whoever they may be, but still has the same kind of values and ideals, an understanding of how the club was established and still carry a bit of that forward. Thank you.